All right, so we are recording. Um, so thank you all so much for, for coming to today's, I, I think what is our, our first ever um, lunchtime dialogue. Uh, so we're really interested to see how this goes and we're also really excited about our, our speaker today. Um, so as always, a, a quick couple of announcements to, to get us started. Um, the, the first one, which is really important for Sustainable Claremont, is that this is our Earth Action Week. It's the week that we devote to um, celebrating Earth Day, which is this week, and also we can celebrate Arbor, Arbor Day too, which is also um, coming up. So if you haven't already, you've, you've probably seen we have quite a few ads and emails and, and everything going out right now for Earth Action Week. If you haven't seen that yet, um, my colleague Angela is going to drop that into the chat box. Um, please check that out and, and we have some great tips on how you can take action and do good things for the environment and today we're focusing on trees so it's all very applicable um, for our, our speaker um, today. Second, our second announcement is that since we're not going to be able to get together for our normal Arbor Day celebration this year, we're doing something a little different. We're trying to bring Arbor Day to you and so we've got these adorable little tree seedlings, these Coast Live Oaks, and I'll be delivering a couple of these today to some of our um, supporters. And so for a little donation, we're going to be giving these away. And, and if, you've, if you've got a home for them at your house, you can plant them. If you want us to find a home for them, we'll be donating some to local schools and teachers and garden coordinators who are going to find a home for them um, elsewhere. Uh, so again, that's something that Angela's going to drop into the chat box, and, and you could follow that. Um, also, if you enjoy these, these um, dialogues, please sign up for our newsletter. You'll get all the information um, that we have about Earth Action Week and Arbor Day and all of our programs and when we have these talks. Um, before we get to our speaker, uh, just a, a, another quick announcement that we will have a, a question and answer session at the, the end of her talk. Um, you can either type your questions into the chat box during the presentation and we'll collect those and we'll, we'll drop those into a document and, and ask them to her um, during the Q&A time. Or you can wait till the end and you can raise your hand and we'll, we'll unmute you so that you can ask live. And any questions that don't get answered during the, the talk today, um, we could forward to, to our speaker after and we can try to follow up on those. Okay, so our introduction. So today our, our speaker is Christina Banzanson, whose name I already probably messed up after asking how to say it. Um, she's a lecturer in arboriculture and urban forestry at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, she's a board master certified arborist, municipal specialist and tree risk assessor with the International Society for Arboriculture, as well as the Massachusetts certified arborist. Um, she's also recently featured in the New York Times New England Forests Are Sick article, which is a great article that I recently reread this morning in preparation for today's talk. Um, and just an all around um, scholar when it comes to these issues of urban forestry and arboriculture. So we're super excited to have her. Um, and Christina, I'll go ahead and, and throw it to you. All right. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me today. I'm going to go ahead and get started and share the screen. All right, give me a thumbs up if you are seeing the... Perfect. All right, yeah. wonderful. Today I'm going to talk about, well, we're talking about trees and sustainability, but what I really focus on are, are trees and the urban environment. So trees where we live, work, and play. Typically, the trees um, in our urban forests are called street trees. Sometimes they're known as shade trees, depending on what region of the country you're living on. But these trees are really going to help mitigate the effects of climate change where, where we're living. Again, trees all over the world are helping with this, but to make our homes and our cities livable and breathable, and more comfortable, we really are going to, we need to focus on these uh, street trees, which are just the workhorses of, of the city. Uh, and I'm going to kind of cover some um, 
you know, conditions that uh, we need to pay attention to when we're caring for our, our street trees and our urban trees and um, the challenges that they have. And then who, who cares for them? And again, please uh, type uh, questions in the chat um, and we'll be happy to um, talk about your concerns or questions at, at the end. And already I'm going backwards. It's Monday. So urban forestry is kind of an oxymoron word. Some people, uh, you know, kind of look at those two words and it's kind of opposites. Uh, but urban forestry is generally the practice of caring for all of the vegetation in, in a city. So you're, you're not just caring for trees, but you're caring for shrubs, sometimes um, uh, parklands, and it could be golf courses or schoolyards, uh, but it's all of that associated vegetation that um, is, is, is in the city. And if you're looking at uh, tree canopy, that is when you're in an airplane and you're viewing your city from above, the urban tree canopy um, is comprised of both trees on public property and of private property. Generally, the trees that are city owned, and again, this is broad range, it's not for every city in the country, but uh, in the United States, most cities only own about 20% 20, 20 of that urban tree canopy. And so the rest of the tree canopy is 80%. So that's, you know, privately owned. So it could be government institution, private property owners. But often we hear about the trees in the city and, and the city isn't doing a good job taking care of their trees. Well, they only own 20% of it. So we're, we're trying to get the word out there that collectively everybody has a stake in this and trees on private property are just important or if not more to, to help um, mitigate our, our living conditions in the um, urban forest. So again, the, the vegetation, when we think of an urban forest, um, it is also sometimes known as green infrastructure. Uh, green infrastructure is generally found in adjacent to your gray infrastructure. So we know our bridges, our roads, our transportation system is sort of our, our gray infrastructure, our utilities. So storm pipes for water and sewer, our electricity, gas lines, um, um, communication, so your uh, um, fiber optics, cables, all that's sort of the gray infrastructure. And the green infrastructure often shares that space or tries to share that space. And there's even blue infrastructure, which, so you would think of rivers and streams. And uh, again, so you kind of have the green, gray, and the blue. I'm really excited that we are, uh, as a country, going to start repairing a lot of our uh, gray infrastructure. But my um, alert to everyone would be to um, stand um, up and make sure that your gray infrastructure plans in your towns and cities is not leaving out the green infrastructure because um, that's greatly going to affect our, um, you know, our quality of life um, going down the road. Community forestry, that's another term that uh, is interchangeable or, or people hear this a lot. Community forestry is a term that for people who live in suburban or rural lands feel a little bit better than saying urban forestry because maybe they're not in a place that has uh, lots of, um, you know, surface parking lots and tall buildings and skyscrapers. Community forestry would be your, your small towns. Um, Massachusetts, where I live, is an unusual state for the country because we have a huge density of people. Our, you know, our state is relatively small and we have a large density of, of canopy trees and large trees. So we are a lot of people living amongst a lot of trees. And unlike the, the um, parts of the the west or the middle of the country, it's you have a lot more urban sprawl or you've got, you know, huge tracts of forests with relatively few people, if any people living in those forests. And then you have big cities and then the, the we're kind of um, 
all blended up here in New England. And over the years, we've seen a lot of change. You know, a hundred years ago, we had much less forest because we had much more agricultural land. And I, I can't really start talking about trees with a little bit of tree biology. Um, we, we've had so much uh, interest lately, especially during COVID for people to do home gardening and care for plants, especially uh, the growing popularity in house plants. And when I ask people, well, have you planted any trees? I'm like, oh, I, I just, you know, I plant, you know, tomatoes and other things. And, and I wouldn't know how to care for a tree. Well, a tree is just a really, really big plant, okay? Uh, it, it, I think of it as a perennial. So a tree is going to grow year after year and come back. A tree is um, comprised of, of many different systems. So you, you have your um, tree canopy, the leaves, uh, the, the above ground portions. It's supported by trunk and branches. And then you have the underground portion of the roots. Um, and, and every single one of these um, systems has to work together. And if there's a failure or a, a problem or a disruption in one of those systems, it's greatly gonna affect the other parts and how they work and function. And the tree is really unique. A tree is a, a much slower growing um, um, thing, I guess, than, than you think of like a human, you know? So a, a tree has the opportunities, again, depending on certain species, it could, could live for hundreds of years or thousands of years. So their time frame is a little bit different than like the lifespan of maybe a human. So the tree, the tree can respond to some of these changes or relatively, um, you know, how they, if it's gonna be quick or slow or how they react is gonna be um, whether that tree adapts or is able to handle that, that stress. Trees are also, you know, plants that manufacture their own food through photosynthesis. And again, photosynthesis, if everything is working just fine, you know, we, we have sunlight and water and certain temperatures and um, you gotta have carbon dioxide and then they can produce their own food. I would just love it for scientists to invent some kind of uh, chlorophyll sun lotion that I could put on top of me and imagine just walking outside, putting your arms out, looking, looking at the sun with sunglasses and, and feeding yourself and say, oh, I just had lunch. Or, and then you're, you know, the next time the sun comes out, oh, I just had dinner. That's, that's, you know, trees are making their own food through photosynthesis. So when we do things like prune a tree, and we over prune the tree or we take too much of those leaves away, we basically took away all their food factories, okay? When we cut into the root system and or we, we trench or we um, um, compact the soil, we affect that root system, then the, without the good root system, they can't make more leaves. So it, it kind of comes back and forth. Same thing, if we injure that trunk, we drill holes or nail signs or um, saw into the trunk, then we interrupt that transport system for that, those nutrients from the roots to get to the leaves. So again, there's a disruption in how that system is working. And then other technical things, um, you know, a tree is a woody plant. Sometimes you hear woody plants technically, or, you know, is, there's loose definitions when you look it up, but generally trees are 20 feet and higher. And um, a shrub would be something that's like 15 feet below. And when something we call a bush, that's generally only rose bushes and blueberry bushes. And I love this diagram. I can't remember where it came from. I've been using it in presentations for years. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, it's one of the best, um, you know, anatomy pictures of a tree. So often we see a picture of a tree and its root system is a mirror image that reflects the, the tree above. And that's really great for art. I mean, I wear a lot of tree jewelry and cool things. And you see like symbols on, on trees where the root system comes out and it's a ball. Yes. And so, but in reality, and so our textbooks are lousy for really, really showing how tree roots actually really do grow. And if you look in, in the um, 
the picture, it's, it's the very fine roots, the, the roots as, as thin as your hair are really located in that top 12 to 18, 18 inches of soil. And the roots that go deep down below, there's often, there's, you know, the, the mystery of a tap root. Tr trees start out with a tap root, but as they mature, they often lose that tap root and it, and they did have sinker roots. And depending on the soil types, if you're on the sandy coast and the tree is on the, on the edge of a mountain, again, sometimes they're going to have some roots that anchor down and those are called sinker roots. But for the most part, we want a tree to look above ground as healthy as this tree. My point with this slide is we have to have space for trees. And that space not only exists above ground, which I think people have been paying a good attention to, realizing when they plant a tree, they look up and they decide where they're gonna plant it. But we really need to pay attention to, to below ground as well. So trees and sustainability. Um, my, my first, boss in urban forestry was a former Marine. And if you know Marines, they like to use acronyms for everything. So when we would um, meet together in the morning, we would have the POD, you know, the plan of the day, and we would just, you know, decide where we were going, what we were doing. When he was first teaching me about the benefits of trees and the benefits of urban forestry and how to communicate with a whole different bunch of stakeholders. Sometimes I'd have to talk to political um, government leaders. Other times I would talk to garden clubs. Sometimes you'd talk to environmentalists and other times you would talk to um, economic development people. Not everyone has the same, not everyone loves trees. I mean, you're here today, hopefully you all love trees, but there's a lot of people who, who don't, you know, they don't have a connection with trees or they're not sure why trees are a big deal or why they need to spend money to plant a tree or save a tree. So my my former boss, Mick Leschen, came up with the acronym of SAFER to help um, talk about all the benefits of trees. The tree in this picture is a, it's a black oak. This was a, um, uh, a, a subdivision that was being developed in Virginia. The, de the landscape architect who was helping plan the site discovered on, before they built all these homes that there was a, a champion large beautiful tree this was an old farm field that was left and then um, not developed and you know it mentioned it to the developer and said hey you know you've got a remarkable champion tree on your site and so the developer understood you know if he was to preserve that tree he would have uh, better payback into um, making this brand new ho housing development look like it already belonged there it would look already established because it would take hundreds of years to, to grow a tree like this. The thing is the, the developer had to give up one of his lots of his homes starting in the low 750s, you know? So again, that's a big, a big investment for that. But his, all the houses around that tree sold first. They sold for higher prices. Um, again, people come from all around to, to or save that tree. And if you remember the picture from before of that root space, you can see that the, the land around there was preserved and not disturbed in order to um, maintain that tree. So uh, we're gonna go through safer. So social aspects of trees, uh, especially during COVID, you've seen so many people um, going to the outdoors, recreating and, and just gathering around trees. You know, it's, um, something that folks have been doing for years and years and years, working, um, here's a, you know, a typical New England town where the town common and the church and the library were all built around a little common area and then have trees and people gather for parades and picnics and political activism, whatever's going on, it's around the, t the town common. So again, people, um, outdoor weddings, um, picnics, just people love to, to be around trees. But unfortunately, you know, socially, not all of our neighborhoods are as equitable um, having uh, trees in all the neighborhoods. So right now with a lot of environmental justice, again, if we're thinking sustainability, we're trying to get trees in everybody's neighborhood, not just maybe the center of town or where the most uh, economy is in the town. 
Uh, New York City is another example of um, having a social um, gathering around trees. The High Line, if you're familiar with that, was an old rail line that was converted into this uh, horticultural uh, phenomenon where they made a path and it's, you know, an elevated rail and all of the landscaping is um, gorgeous. I can't remember if it's like half a mile long, but it, it goes through um, New York City and you just you just admire all of the people looking at plants, touching the plants, seeing the trees. Again, it's a great social place. And then not to mention the businesses and the people around um, the area have um, completely uh, benefited from the, the, the high line in the trees. And then aesthetics, oftentimes, uh, trees were planted in cities or around buildings to enhance the building. You know, behind me is a kind of a, you know, an old um, gray brick building, but it looks so much better when it's softened by trees and landscaping. And, and often people admire a tree for its, it's not just its, um, its leaves, but it's got gorgeous bark. It might have beautiful berries. It might have um, interesting fruit, uh, flowers. So it's the year round beauty that trees provide that is um, also uh, pretty amazing. In New England, we're fortunate with our fall foliage. There's a huge uh, economical, um, you know, uh, tourism for people coming here just to see leaves and to, um, be, you know, be fall foliage, just like so many people always want to go to the beach or see the ocean. People want to have New England on their bucket list to see the fall foliage. Again, here's a forest picture. This is this is how typical trees want to be growing. Mixed species growing close together, all different ages. In, in the, underneath these trees, the soil is not disturbed. All the leaf, leaf debris that's coming down from the trees stays on the forest and it, it provides mulch and, and retains water. And that's, that's how trees like to behave. But again, we put them, we go to um, move them into the city and we expect them to behave the same way. Again, who doesn't love a, um, a tree in the springtime? Um, and you just look at the architecture and, and aesthetics. So um, we could go on, we could have just an hour talk on just the aesthetics of trees. Functional, you know, we know the trees provide us oxygen, trees um, provide shade, trees are not only providing habitat for um, uh, insects and pollinators, we, you know, providing us fruit, um, you know, timber, you know, toilet paper. I'm, I don't like using plastic toilet paper, you know, like, uh, so trees still are a good thing to have. Paper, I, you know, still like to use paper. They are a renewable resource. Um, but yeah, trees have so many different functions. Uh, the world's biodiversity uh, lives in forests. And again, you know, forests that have lots of different species of trees. The more species we have, the more insects we have, the more insects we have, the more birds you're going to have. So unfortunately in our homes, we like things to be matchy matchy. Uh, very simplistic. And again, depending on if you're in places that have planned um, um, ho housing developments, they, they plant the same type of trees, the same shrubs. And sometimes there's a really a lack of biodiversity. You may have good, you know, tree canopy or shade, but we don't have that biodiversity. So then we're, we're losing um, some of the species. Uh, economical. Again, trees provide a lot of benefits, um, improve property values, improve uh, real estate. So um, trees, houses with trees, um, wooded lots generally sell higher than a, a, a home without any trees. Again, neighborhoods with, with trees are um, more desirable for people, you know, just uh, again, but sustainability wise, our economics in these type of tree-lined streets are not um, very equitable across many, many cities. So trying to um, work again for the environmental justice. But, you know, it's it saves so much money and for so many different reasons. Um, so you can actually, there's two ways you can validate, uh, add value to trees. So there's more than two ways, but these are very popular and easy to use. 
you got to know your tree species. So hopefully you can figure out what kind of tree you have. You can use the National Tree Benefits Calculator or iTree, and you need to measure the tree. We call it a DBH, which is diameter at breast height, four and a half feet up the ground and measure around the tree. So if you have that DBH and the species, you can kind of come up with quantifications on these trees and see what the, um, the values are. This is an oak tree that has about 132, almost $133,000 um, value according to the Council of Tree and Landscape Appraisers. Uh, it talks about how much um, energy it would save, how much carbon is sequestered, so uh, on and on and on. And these are wonderful um, tools to use when you're looking at quantifying trees. Again, recreational. Um, you know, people want to gather around trees, want to um, participate in tree events. This is a winery in Oregon, and um, you know, it's one of these wineries where you can come and taste and have a tour. I mean, it just it looks like a postcard. Uh, picture of just, um, you know, coming out here. And I can just imagine how, you know, this gets, you know, people out into the landscape, um, you know, really um, loving trees, still outdoor gardening, hunting, fishing. You, you got to have trees to, to do these things. If we, you know, your fish are going to um, do much better if they live in rivers that are cooled down and have uh, lower temperatures of water for breeding. And so if all the trees are gone, you're going to have less fishing. So even fishermen need to have some trees. Uh, here again is a local, we do a, um, a tree bicycle tour. So it's a self-guided tour of some of the champion trees. And it's a real popular thing. And again, um, gets families and all different folks out and out about both exercising and, um, you know, caring for the trees. So again, trees and climate change. You know, um, I think, again, there's a lot out there, and this is so important, and I'm really glad to see it. You know, trees are, are helping us cool the planet. They really help to mitigate uh, weather. They um, are, are uh, you know, not to, you know, this is, this picture speaks for itself. This is a hot day in Washington, D.C. This tree was like the only shade real estate um, this is May in DC, um, and it's a horribly hot day. You can even see the um, smog and the and the skyline. This this tree is providing shade. It's probably 20 degrees cooler where these people are sitting under the tree, and it's even cooler on the pavement than it is out on the street. You see the people in the bottom left hand corner have moved out, and they're sitting you know half on the pavement because that's cooler than sitting on the grass that doesn't have any any shade. But trees that, you know, they are sequestering carbon, they are um, cooling our planet, they are uh, filtering pollution, they are helping to um, uptake stormwater, but these are healthy trees. And these are trees that are large. So unlike other things like, um, you know, when your car gets old, it goes, it goes down in value. As a tree gets older, it goes up in value because it's going to be worth more because it can sequester more carbon. It can um, can can handle um, more stormwater. It can provide more shade. Again, if it's if it's healthy, uh, really, 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 really old trees don't have much. You know, they're kind of hollow in the middle, so they're not as sequestering as much carbon as you know some of our medium age trees. So. Trying our, to get our trees to old age is, is something that arborists are going to try to do. So uh, this is a, uh, if you look at some of the Arbor Day information or the iTree information, that will help you to determine where you can put your trees on your property to maximize your benefits. Um, you know, uh, um, three trees around your home can, you know, help shade so that you're not using as much air conditioning um, you know, up to 30%. That's a lot. That's a lot. Now, again, um, you probably have more solar than we do here. And of course, you, you know, would have to carefully design your trees so it wouldn't block solar, but it would still benefit um, uh, other shade. Um, so again, managing trees. That's, if we really want to have these um, trees give us those benefits of sequestering carbon, cooling down the planet. 
um, providing oxygen, habitat for our animals. Um, we've got to really care for them. And I, I think, again, we, we're, I'm all excited that everybody's planting trees everywhere, but we really need to decide if the planting sites are really, really going to stay and um, make really big decisions. Uh, I think sometimes slow down a little bit before we just run out and plant a tree. So we want to make sure that these trees are not going to outgrow their locations, are not going to have conflicts with infrastructure. Um, again, challenges, you know, trees, we expect them to be beautiful and grow big, just like we did when we went to the nursery to pick it out. So we want these trees, you know, these are trees in a, in a downtown site in Boston. Um, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to have challenges. Again, you're going to have infrastructure changes, um, lack of um, airflow. They're, they're not growing in that forest situation or those wide, wide things. We've got a lot of, um, issues that will make these trees a little bit stressed out. And when a tree is stressed out, then it's going to get, you think back to that systems um, image that I showed you, uh, if, if any of those systems are interrupted because maybe it has insects or the roots aren't, don't have enough room or it's not getting enough water, it's going to start to stress out. And when it stress out, it'll decline. Again, um, picking the right site conditions for the right tree. Uh, here's um, a Mediterranean um, in, you know, south of France type of an area. You know, would you really want to be in the hot summer riding your bike um, down the street without shade from the trees? And these uh, tree wells are designed so that a little bit of runoff when it gets rain can go and go right into those tree wells. So again, smart design and how are we going to prepare for, um, you know, because no one's really going out here watering these trees. So it has to be prepared for supplemental um, watering. And again, site, you know, what type of site conditions? Here we have a lot of salt tolerance. We're not necessarily near the ocean, but we have uh, snow. So uh, people are salting sidewalks, salting the roads. And, and again, sometimes in the winter, you're not thinking about that in the summer when you plant the tree, you don't think, oh yeah, this is gonna have inundation from chemicals from road salts. Um, or you could have sea spray if you're near the ocean. But that soil volume, remember how far those roots grow, we gotta make space underground, uh, whether you're using in, uh, you know, structural soils, which can help support um, buildings and sidewalks and roadways and also allow for roots to grow or just really good uh, tree space and design. And then think about how you're going to irrigate. If you don't have irrigation, are you going to hire uh, folks to do supplemental watering during the, the summer months? And so um, a little bit at terms around sometimes here, uh, people don't know what the word arboriculture or arborist is. Um, so the arborists, again, are in, they're caring for individual trees. They're, you know, I, I, the New York Times said tree doctor. We don't really call ourselves tree doctors, but you are trained in tree care. And really, again, we're, we're, we're looking at individual trees because we want them to, to stay a, around the landscape as long as they can. Again, a forester is growing trees kind of as a product for a crop. They're trying to grow them really fast so they can use them fast. Sometimes we're a little bit different. We want that tree to stay around for a long time. And so arborists, it's a combination of science and art. Um, again, when, when trees get really large and they get old, they need space because they, pose a, they can pose a risk to um, property, people, and buildings. So instead of cutting this tree down because, oh no, the tree is gonna fall and hit somebody in the park, they roped off the tree and they said, you know, please stay away. So this way the tree can stay there a little bit longer and it's not going to pose any risk to people because unless they trespass and go beyond the line where they're not. But that's like jumping into the lion's cage, the zoo, and it says don't jump into the lion cage. So um, we, we try to keep people out. Again, um, arborists are using standards, again, looking at trees that can possibly pose a risk and trying to mitigate that with, with science-based industry standards. So many people ask me, well, how much do I know how to prune a tree or what, how do we plant it? Or do I put anything in the hole when I plant it? Well, arborists have their own, you know, American um, national standards. And you can uh, look at these and these are updated every two to five years, again, based on science and they're peer reviewed. So we, we really do have standards and these really should be written into a lot of uh, city ordinances and practiced here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, tree planting partnerships with towns and nonprofits. 
and again, they are using the standards. The gentleman on the ground with his knee pointing is the, we have tree wardens in New England. So again, that, that's the guardian of the trees. So he's uh, checking to make sure that this tree is being properly planted according to industry standards because he's working with volunteers and they may not know and um, really working to make sure we have quality assurance for that. Again, tree mortality, yeah, we've got tree issues all across the world for different reasons. New England, we've had a lot of droughts back to back. The back to back droughts has brought an insect attack because these trees were weakened. And then when they're weakened tree, they are attracting, we have a gypsy moth caterpillar and um, they've been coming along. And, and the problem is there's so many standing dead trees because the towns and the municipalities do not have enough funds or workers to go and remove those trees. Just like in California, you've had a lot of issues with your transmission lines and in big forest because there's not enough people skilled in arboriculture and, and these urban forestries to be maintaining these, um, these grid lines. Um, we're trying to educate people so that again, people are prepared like, why did all this, this beautiful tree that was here, like, why are you cutting it down? And again, sometimes, you know, there's, there's trees that are being cut down to prevent the spread to other trees. So um, when there's, uh, you know, other measures that just can't be taken. Um, again, I, I'm really hoping that more young people are going to be excited, old people too, <laughs> but, you know, um, we need more um, arborists and urban foresters. Everyone loves, you know, they want to work outdoors, they want to be an environmentalist. We, you know, I hear from a lot of students, but when we say, well, would you like to be, you know, the person, you know, an arborist, they're like, oh, that looks like hard work. Yeah, it is hard work, but the, you don't have to physically be in the tree all the time. There's lots of jobs in different sectors, but it's rewarding work. Sometimes you do a lot of physical stuff when you're young, and then as you get older, you do all the, the paperwork. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we really need more folks in this industry. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, sites that I put on here for you. It's the Urban Forestry Toolkit. It's a relatively new website and it has lots of different partners that are putting in case studies. So if you're a, a tree commission, a town or a group, or you're working with your city and you wanna improve your uh, city ordinances or you are not sure where to start, this maps you through from beginning to end and has a lot of great, great stuff. Um, and again, if you, if you, you know, here's a, a park um, in, in Boston, which was sort of, it's sort of new. I mean, Boston's, you know, really, really old town, um, but this is relatively a new place where um, when landscaping was done over, again, the green infrastructure, this is being maintained by horticulture staff, you know, um, people who are trained. If you really are expecting your green spaces to look this good, you need to invest in, in horticulturists and arborists and people who are trained to care for plants. And, and, and or you need to train your Department of Public Works people on horticulture practices. So, so, so often I see these great things that are installed in cities, but then there's no maintenance uh, information or education on how do you maintain it. And they end up weed whacking everything down to a square meatball or ice cube and, um, again, not knowing, you know, which, which plants and, and how to care for. Um, so again, do we want to be planting trees that are going to be a future conflict for someone else? Often trees outlive their, their tree owners. I hate that word tree owner, but again, trees are going to live for 500, 600 years. So are you planting a tree that's going to be, the, you know, another generation's problem when they have to move the sidewalk or um, put in other infrastructure? So give that tree space and, and look ahead, you know, look at, you know, your city's master plan, your, you know, future plan and say, is the road going to be widened here in 20 years? If it is, then let's go back another 10 feet. Sometimes that's working with um, private property owners and getting a setback and saying, hey, this is, we want to plant this tree for the city, but we'd like to encroach on your property because, you know, the sidewalk in 20 years is going to be widened and then that tree is going to have to come down. So, um, you know, really, really thinking about those, the future um, of trees. Unfortunately, this is a, a tree in a nearby town in Massachusetts. This is one of our, our this is our largest champion tree on our list. But our state um, guidelines for trees and construction 
don't match up our current industry standards. So we're getting caught right now with all these infrastructure projects being built, not being able, the state, you know, by law doesn't have to really do any tree preservation methods uh, because their, their, um, their guidelines are really not up to date with the current science. So you, know, you hate to see things like this, uh, you know, big old tree that's uh, probably about 300 years old is going to really be impacted by, again, we need the sidewalks widened, we need ADA accessible, we need better streets, but we, you know, I can argue that I think we can, we can do both, you know, but we've, we've got a plan for it. We have to be in the design process at the beginning, not at the end. And, it, and again, thinking of your, um, your, you know, more and more people are going to be living in cities. And um, do we want to live in cities without trees? Can you imagine what your neighborhood would look like if you didn't have any trees? And I hope, and I thank you for your time. If I went over, I'm, I'm not a um, quick speaker. So thank you for your time and attention. And I'd love to take some questions. No, it's so great. I, I learned so much by watching that, Christina. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I didn't see any questions pop up in the chat um, during your talk, um, but I know that Nicole has a question. Um, so Nicole, do you want to unmute yourself and, and start things off? Yeah. Um, so I recently read an article about how um, the fact that we predominantly planted male trees instead of female trees because of the females having the litter um, that is looked down upon by cities, that that is really affecting our allergies and our health. Um, so I just want to see if you could kind of expand on that topic or talk about it for those that maybe haven't seen that article um, and like what we can do to um, combat that. And I don't know, do nurseries tend to typically have male species at their uh, in stock that we would have to kind of talk with them to get them to um, stock more female trees? Just anything you have on that topic. Yeah, so um, a great question that that um, comes up a lot. And if you think back to tree biology or, um, you know, how plants work, tree pollen is basically tree sperm, you know, to, so male trees actually have a lot more pollen content than females. So it's kind of, it, it's, it's, you know, people are saying we don't want the the fruit on the sidewalks because of course that can pose um, maybe nuisance it could maybe the fruit if it doesn't get eaten by birds it could be slippery and people could trip it could be smelly it could attract flies or rats or you know something so some you know again appropriate planting of the right trees but we don't have that um uh, that even sex population in our street trees, because often either we're planting trees that are, again, male, male cultivars, especially the ginkgo, which is one of my favorite trees that I had earlier. A lot of people don't plant a female ginkgo because they don't want the fruit. So the, the more male trees you have, the more pollen you're going to have. And the pollen is, you know, particular matter that's going to, you know, um, be more of a nuisance than, than anything else. One of my favorite books, um, I don't know if I have it within reach, it's um, the allergy, it's somewhere, it's the allergy, I can um, send it to you, but there's an allergy um, gardening book, and um, the gentleman who wrote the book helped with, you know, when the weatherman gets up in the morning and says, today we're going to have a pollen index of 22 or, you know, 10, this gentleman who wrote the book um, helped with the USDA uh, pollen index. So he's got a whole list of the tree species and whether they cause pollen or, I mean, it, uh, allergens or not. And there's a lot of allergens that, uh, that cause problems besides just pollen. So he's got this uh, great book in the table and, uh, and I can um, send that to you um, as, as a resource. But yeah, ha having um, mixed ages, mixed sexes. There's our, down in the Southwest, um, they do actually have um, tree ordinances to not plant male trees because a lot of people do have allergies. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the more trees you can have, it's actually better for people with allergies because the leaves are like sponges. And so a lot of the particulate matter, so dust particles, other pollution are going to stick to the leaves. So there's studies that show that, you know, people who have asthma um, have less asthma on tree-lined streets than if they live in a place without. So trees get blamed for asthma 
but sometimes it, you know, they're actually um, better to have around. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did not know that about the leaves. Yeah. That would be great. If you can send me that um, book at some point, I can add it to um, that list of resources that you compiled, which I'm going to drop it in the chat for anybody who's interested. Christina can buy, compiled just a, looking at that book. Okay. I'm telling you, I, it is, it's a, it's a great book. Yeah, for sure. I would definitely take a read. Um, so I'm going to drop a list of resources in the chat for anybody who's interested. And then when Christina sends me over that book, I can add that on there for anybody else who's interested. Hey, Christina, is that something when like, it, um, you know, people are purchasing their trees that they can request of a nursery, um, a female tree or a male tree? Or is it that most of the time for like wholesalers, does it the default one or the other? Or how does that work? Yeah, again, it's the it's the cultivars. So um, some are some are going to be um, you're you're not necessarily going to get that choice. And a lot of it has. And I I found the book, so I just put that in the link. So it's um, the allergy fighting garden. Um, you know, some some trees, for instance, hollies. Um, you need to have a male and a female if you want to get holly berries. So the the trees, you know, we need to have and. This, Again, certain fruit trees with orchard trees, you know, we need to have both. Um, but for things like oak trees and um, um, maples and things, um, you know, you are um, you're getting a you're you're usually getting a cultivar. Um, so sometimes you, you, you can't necessarily, you know, it, it's hard to get a female tree unless you're getting maybe a, a, a straight species and then you've got to let it grow for a while. But I really, I really think that you should, um, this book is a great resource. He also has a good website um, that, that helps you um, work on that too. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then I've, I've got a, um, a question for you. Um, as you were talking about, um, you know, how when trees are planted, we have to think a lot about the, the long term and where we're planting is really like an investment in that space and, you know, is going to have implications for that, that area. Um, with, with the climate changing, um, are urban foresters paying more attention now to um, so the climate zones where, where trees are being planted and how those climates might shift in the next 30 years or 50 years, since there's such long living, you know, uh, entities, um, how, how is that weighing in, in in the decisions that are being made for what trees to plant? So, you know, a native species maybe in 30 years is going to be less resilient and per perhaps re less resilient than a different type. So if you could speak to that, I'd love to hear more about that. So, so there's a lot of people practicing, they're calling it assisted migration. Again, remember those trees can't get up and move, but a lot of people are starting to um, look at climate predictions for their, for their zones. If you, if you think of the USDA hardiness zone map, the last map I believe came out in 2006, and the data for that probably wasn't, un, you know, was collected in the 90s. So we really haven't, since 2006, think of all of the years we've had the hottest year on record and then with the next hottest year on record and the next year, hottest year. The Arbor Day Foundation has a more realistic um, uh, zone map and, it, and you gotta take in the heat besides just the, the cold tolerances. Um, so for, again, there's, there's you know, climate centers that are working um, to, to help people say, okay, if you live in, um, you know, this region of the country in, in 20 years from now, it's more going to be like this region. And again, you just watch, watch these maps. And even we've seen that with our storms and our weather patterns, you know, the, the storms we have right now, the fires that you have right now, you know, things are, are they're going to get worse. They may, may uh, again, our droughts are going to be longer or we're going to have more, more droughts. We're having lots of tornadoes in New England. You know, usually we get a tornado every hundred years. Um, so um, people are, are using some of this climate science. For instance, in the Northeast, we're now trying to introduce a lot of trees that are, were found in the mid-Atlantic. So um, we are still going to have winter in the Northeast. I'm not going to be planting palm trees in my front yard in Massachusetts, but I am going to be planting 
trees that may be found in Baltimore um, because they still get cold and frost in Baltimore. But again, it's something that's going to be a little bit more resilient. Um, certainly, we have to deal with longer periods of, of droughts and other places you're having sea level rise. So you may have species that are uh, riparian, lowland type of trees that will do better. So again, it's that site specific, um, you know, how are we going to determine? But the other thing is, and the, the, the positive side is there are going to be trees that are going to do really well in this, in this class. So there's going to be, you know, 400 years ago, or no, 150 years ago in New England, one out of every four trees was an American chestnut. And they're like, they're, you know, they're gone. Like I live amongst hemlock trees. I know that in, you know, probably 20 years, there's not going to be a lot of hemlocks around, but there's going to be other trees that are going to be doing really well. And, and um, it's just, things are going to change. So it just, it, it's that sentimental um, side of things. You know, trees aren't going away. It's just the, the composition and the makeup of them are, are going to, but so, for me, if you, again, I have predominantly one type of species where I lived because the, the land wasn't managed. So I'm trying to be proactive and introduce a different species so that when these trees are gone in 20 years, I've got new ones already starting to establish and they're small and young. So they're, they're gonna handle the changes a little bit better than the mature older trees. That's great. Great. I'm going to go ahead and read another question um, that's in the chat box here. Um, so this is from Vanita, who's one of our board members. And she says, thanks for the great presentation. What is your opinion of the use of structural cells uh, for urban street trees to protect the tree roots and also stormwater conservation? And maybe what is the solution for root and pavement issues in urban uh, areas based on your experience? Oh, yeah. So they're awesome. So again, a structural cell is like, a, you think of like an egg crate and it can help support, again, the sidewalk. I mean, I, you know, if you want to have streets, if you want to have trees, large canopy trees in urban plazas and urban settings, you still have to have the fire truck drive right up to the building, right? I want the ambulance to get to my house or my building. Um, so we have to have support for that. But, if, but for those trees, if we have to share that space, structural soils is a combination of um, like, um, almost like gravel and sand. It's in there, they are um, procurement, just like the structural cells are. So the good and the bad, you know, um, the, the, good, the good part is they, they really do their job. Engineers, I think, like them because they're, you know, cubes and they're blocks and you, you know, you put them together. But this, the downside of that is that's really expensive. Um, but again, we need to invest in the way we're planting trees. And it's not just digging a hole and sticking the tree in there and live in, you know, expecting it to, to grow and be a big, beautiful thing. But those cells do work great. And hopefully there's going to be more of them on the market. And so that more com competition and maybe the, the cost can come down. Um, and, and often, sometimes they have to be installed by the manufacturer or, you know, you just can't um, do that on your own with volunteers. It takes a lot of equipment, but they're, they're, they're wonderful. And if you look at a lot of um, um, the, associ um, yeah, the Association of, um, or American Society of Landscape Architects and look up a lot of Jim Urban's um, work that he has done on urban um, trees, you can see uh, many awards and um, uh, case studies of these trees and these uh, structural cells, and they're just wonderful. And the trees, you know, he goes back several years after installing to show that they're still growing and, and doing well. So, yeah, if you can, if if it's in your budget and it's the you know uh, a built environment that that can do it, um, they're very successful. That's great. Um, okay, I've got one last question here. It's really a good one. Uh, one that we always think about a lot um, at Sustainable Claremont when we're doing like tree selection. Um, so here's the question. It's, um, is there a debate or discussion about whether it's better to plant fruit trees or like avo or avocado trees or whatever versus native trees based on what type will make people more motivated to preserve a tree or not remove it when, if it becomes inconvenient. So I guess it's like a tree 
choice selection yeah. um, issue. So how does that weigh into those types of decisions? Yeah, so that that's really important. I mean, we're talking about food insecurity um, in many cities. And, and again, um, how are we going to improve quality of life for everybody? Uh, food forests are, are I don't, I don't necessarily hear that term a lot anymore, but um, maybe, you know, 10 years ago, there were, like, like I think Portland, Oregon has a, a food forest, but it's a designated park. So it's not, we're not growing avocado trees as street trees, because you don't want the avocados landing on your convertible, you know. Um, so um, we are, we're designating pro public property, you know, maybe, uh, you know, why not a school, school gardens, or churches or other community centers um, where instead of just uh, a tree that's got flowers is this tree going to provide fruit but um, again often is street trees unless it has a, a large green space and are there going to is it access is there if it's a tree with fruit are, you, are people going to be running across a five lane highway to try to pick the berries of the fruit and it that poses more of a danger or these again in an area that is a community center and you know designated place for um, uh, fruit. But often, um, you know, fruit trees were not allowed in cities. And um, it, you know, if you've got the space in in parks and things, it it should be. Um, same with shrubs. There's a lot of shrubs that provide fruit. You know. Um, pineapple guava or you know you can eat the blossoms and the fruit and it's a beautiful ornamental shrub um, and again there's you know things maybe native to your region that are uh, fruits and berries but you're not it's not like things that you see at the grocery store here we can grow a plant called the pawpaw and a pawpaw generally you don't see at a farmer's market or the grocery store because it's a, a tree it's a native tree when the fruit ripens it all ripens at the same time. So you can't really transport it or sell it. You gotta eat it all at once. And um, so again, you know, what, what are, are you trying to feed a family, feed a few people? Um, is this, you know, um, more for educational purposes? But certainly um, there's, there's plenty of space um, in our cities to, to, to have some fruit trees and shrubs. Um, again if it's if it's not going to cause um, maintenance issues hey, christine can i ask one more question we've got Absolutely. three minutes left here. okay um uh earlier in your presentation um you talked a bit about um arborists and you know one of the the questions that i get most often when i give presentations is people who want to um you know, find work in green jobs, and they might want to work in a nonprofit that does environmentalism or sustainability. And I think that um, it, becoming an arborist isn't often, you know, it's not talked about as like a green job, or, you know, a part of that sector, but it, it, it's so important, and it really is. And, and uh, in the article, in the New York Times article that you're mentioned in, um, one of the, the uh, arborists was saying how there's like a they joke that there's like 150% job placement rate for arborists. Can you talk a little bit about that, what the market is for somebody who might want to get involved in like, you know, become an arborist, but are not sure about what that path looks like? Maybe just like a brief primer on that. Yeah, so um, arbor culture is a, it purely is a multidisciplinary profession. So, there's not just, unlike saying, well, again, I don't know much about the medical field, but let's say, you know, a nurse anesthetist, you know, there's probably a, a, a planned study. A nurse anesthetist get out of school. They were probably paid about an equal salary. Um, you know, they're licensing. Arborists can get on the job training. Arborists can go to college. Arborists could get a PhD. Arborists could start at 18 years old or at, you know, 55 years old. Uh, you some some states license arborists, some states don't. Uh, so it, it's very confusing um, for for someone to do that. But um, joining your local um, arborist chapter, uh, there's the International Society of Arboriculture. Joining a chapter, uh, going to workshops. Most arborists are certified. They're certified, and it's a voluntary certification. 
So again, sometimes if you're working for the government, they're going to require that you have a certification, but it's 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 not always the case. Um, so it, it's 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 much different because we're we're also considered a trade. So again, unlike an electrician who has to be a licensed electrician before they open their business, arborists sometimes don't have to have that uh, license before they open a business, depending again what region of the country they're in. Um, but you again on the job training, uh, community college education, a college education, uh, sometimes taking classes and workshops. But a lot of this is where the certifications. Uh, mean almost as much uh, as some of the education, um, the, the degrees. If you're going to work for a big commercial um, tree care um, industry, sometimes they're looking at more of a degree, a college education. If you're going to work sort of the, the government sector, they, they generally like to, to see a degree, but a two-year degree uh, certainly can get you um, you know, some really good jobs. Right now, my students are offered bonuses, um, you know, they're 19 years old, 18 years old, and they're, you know, um, starting out, you know, pretty good salary. Uh, some of them get to live on Nantucket Island, and they only pay $100 a week for housing. And, you know, that's a, that's a, um, a place that, you know, would cost thousands of dollars a week normally to live on this beautiful island. Um, so most of my students have three or four or five um, people when they're about to graduate, you know, um, trying to recruit them. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, they've got great uh, benefits, not only 401k, but, um, you know, um, if they can work overtime, they get, they, they make, they make a lot more money than I do. When my students go out on an internship, sometimes they come back with a brand new truck, you know, then the summer out, you know, their first year, I'm like, man, um, so again, there, there, there is a labor shortage. There is also um, just the, 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 the rise in climate change and all of the issues of drought and floods and fires on top of that shortage is crazy. And arbor culture and urban forestry is essential. You know, it's in it, so a lot of it didn't shut down during uh, COVID, you know, there was a little, um, confusion, you know, people had to do things differently because you couldn't cram four people into a pickup truck. People had to take their own vehicles because of the social distancing. But um, arborists stand 10 feet apart because that's an OSHA regulation when you're operating a chainsaw. So we've been pretty good at uh, social distancing um, on some of those. But yeah, there's there's a lot of different opportunities. I would just say start joining a chapter, find someone to mentor you know, that would mentor you. And when, when you ask an arborist how you become an arborist, they get excited and they'll most likely try to take you under their wing and, and help, you, help you out. Uh, and then there's also your, you know, urban forest council that could probably uh, send you in a direction. All right, that's it. I'm moving to Nantucket and working on trees. That's, <laughs> you sold me. All right, well, Christine, thank you so much for your, your presentation and for answering all of our questions. I know I learned a ton and I'm, I'm sure everybody else did too. So normally this is when we would all give you a big round of applause, but we're obviously not in person. Um, but we'll, we'll have this on um, YouTube in the next like few days and we'll post it on our website for anyone who missed it and, and send out a reminder to everybody again. So, so just last time, thanks so much and everyone have a, have a great day. Thank you. Feel, Take free care, to, everybody. feel free to reach out if you weren't on the conversation. You can email me and I'll try to get back to you. Awesome. And we'll collect any comments so and questions and send them your way. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.